Hello everyone, welcome to Shield Classroom. My name is Ram and I'm a cybersecurity evangelist here at Manage Engine. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedules and being here today with me. In today's session, we'll be looking at zero trust and we'll be looking at what zero trust is, why it's important and how you can actually implement it in your organizations. Now, first off, what is zero trust? Well, at the core of zero trust is this philosophy of never trust and always verify. When I say never trust, do I really mean never trust anybody? Do I mean that you should not trust any employee and you know, uh, there should be no transfer of data? No, absolutely not. At the end of the day, data still needs to be transferred between people. There's got to be a flow of data between people. Employees do need to trust each other. But with zero trust, what we're actually aiming for is the way that we manage that trust. So trust still has to be a positive number. It still has to be more than zero. But how do you manage it? That is critical when it comes to the zero trust model. And when we look at this part of the philosophy, always verify, uh, we are making sure that verification is an ongoing process. It's a continuous process. What I mean is that you can't just authenticate a particular user and authorize that same user and then be done with it. You've got to constantly authenticate and re-authenticate the user to make sure that the user is only getting their hands on what is actually entitled to them. So that is what never trust, always verify actually means. Now, here is the actual architecture of the zero trust model. And if you see the elements here in this model, you've got users, you've got endpoints such as devices, data, applications. You've also got the network and infrastructure. Now, you may realize that this is nothing different from what you would have in any traditional network. It's all these elements are all the same. But how you manage the interactions, how you manage the data flow, how you manage the access uh, that you know, different people will have in this model, now that's what makes a zero trust model very, very different. So first off, you've got the users, and user identity is paramount when it comes to the zero trust model. Because at the end of the day, nowadays, uh, attackers are not going after the network. They're not doing any network-based attacks, or not so much anyways. They're going after user identities and they're looking at new ways to compromise those user identities. So you've got to manage your user identities very, very well. One of the best ways to do that is multi-factor authentication or MFA. Now when I say MFA, I actually mean MFA. It's not two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is not multi-factor authentication. And you've got to have at least three different factors of authentication. One. You can have something that the user knows. That would be your traditional username and password. The second factor of authentication could be something that the user possesses. So that could be uh, a push notification on their mobile phone or an OTP, a time-based OTP, if I may add. And the third factor of authentication is something that the user is. So that would be biometric data, such as fingerprint or retina scan. So you've got to have three factors of authentication. The second thing that you can do when it comes to managing your user identities is SSO, which actually brings all the different identities wherever they may exist. Now, they could exist on the cloud or on-premises. They're all brought together under one umbrella, and it makes uh, you know, managing it from a central location very, very easy. You can also do things like UEBA or user and entity behavior analytics to make sure that in a very, very dynamic way, you assess the risk of all of these users, and you make sure that people are not doing any sort of anomalous activity in the network. So this is about users, right? And this becomes extremely important, especially in this day and age, when users are not working within the confines of the physical organization anymore, right? That doesn't happen anymore. People are working from different places. They may work from their homes, they, they can work from coffee shops, they can work from airports, from even from airplanes. Right? So work is more of a thing to get done rather than a place to go to nowadays. So you've got to manage your user identities in a very, very good way, and you've got to have all of these implemented, especially user and entity behavior analytics or anomaly detection. Now, when it comes to devices, again, just like users, you've got to manage your devices. First of all, you've got to have an entire inventory of all the devices you have on hand. Now, this could be a combination of um, managed and unmanaged devices. When I say managed devices, it could be 
devices managed by the organization or owned by the organization. Unmanaged devices are those devices that are actually owned by the employee. That could be their personal mobile phone, laptop, or tablet. But whatever it may be, you've got to have a way to register these devices. And continuously, you've got a way to assess the risk of these devices and make sure that they are always compliant. So you've got to make sure that they have the, the latest patches uh, done on them. Or you've got to make sure that they are running the latest operating systems. The antivirus, the anti-malware, all of that is up to date. You've got to make sure about that. In case there is a situation where some, some of these things are not optimal, then you've got to deny that particular device the connection into your network. Very, very critical. Another thing uh, is you know, this whole use of VPN, right? And many companies still use VPN today, but VPN is not really going to be adequate anymore because if you think about it, VPN basically creates a tunneling effect between the end user's device and the organization's network or the periphery of the organization's network. It's still good, it's better than nothing, but then once the user gets authenticated, it's as if that the user is within the network and they get access to everything, right? So that is really not going to be adequate anymore and you've got a way to manage all of this. When it comes to your data, you've got to make sure that your data is encrypted and end-to-end -end encrypted. So you've got to use encryption with your data. And this also holds true for your data in motion. And then of course the other element that you have in the zero trust model is your network and infrastructure. And here you've got to use micro segmentation. So these are logical segments. Uh, so you can probably use something like geographical location or users or departments, um, specific types of devices. All of these are different ways in which you can logically uh, micro-segment your network. And you've got to make sure that there is no undue traffic or unwarranted traffic that moves between these micro-segments. In case there is a legitimate reason for traffic to move between these micro-segments, uh, for example, let's say that a person from the marketing team is gonna work on a project with somebody from the sales team, and it's a short-term project. Maybe it, this project is gonna run for only one week, then there's got to be an approval process in place where the user requests access to such sort of information that they would not have access to under normal circumstances. And this would be identified at the beginning of the project itself. They would get the approval and they would have access to the data only for that one week, the time when the project is running. And as soon as that week is over, their uh, permissions are going to be revoked automatically. So this is called just in time or JIT, so just in time access or JIT and JIT and or you also have just enough access, JIA. And what I mean by JIA is that let's say that the marketing person who's got access to the sales data for one week does not need to know everything uh, of a particular type of data that they are accessing. Let's say that they are only required to use certain parts of a particular report, then they would only have access to that. On top of that, let's say that there is no reason for this person to be able to print the data, then they would not have the ability to print the data. Or they would not have the ability to download the data. You know, the situation could uh, be different, you know, based on the organization. So that is what ju just enough access or JIA is all about. Now, both of these go hand in hand with what is known as principle of least privilege or P-O-L-P, right? So these are all things that you've got to take into account when you are actually implementing a zero trust architecture within your network. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, I'm Ram. Thank you so much.